green. Don't pinch me. <laughs> Happy St. Pinchy's Day to everyone, but uh, green. So, uh, free. Now it's going in my pocket because green's just not my color. Okay, so, having got the technicalities out of the way, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your kind messages, your warm welcome uh, for those that have just returned home. Thank you for the concern, the care, the, the absolute Christian conduct that you demonstrated to all who just made the trip to Palenque, Mexico and worked for a week with the congregation there. And that trip was a blessing. It was a blessing, hopefully not only to the brethren there, and we hope we were a blessing to them, but it was such an encouragement to those from here that went. Now, Brother Gage and Brother Evan will have more to say about this in due time and have a more complete report, but please just allow us at this point to say thank you for the ch to the church at Forest Hill for being such an encouragement, such a support, and showing such strong interest in the way that this uh, mission effort went. God has spoken. Genesis 1, and God said. Revelation 22, the Spirit and the Bride say come. From bookend to bookend of the Bible, God is speaking. God has spoken. God has spoken through Jesus. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken to us by His Son. God has spoken. And He's spoken to us by Jesus. He's also spoken to us about Jesus. Now there's much said in the world today by religious people about Jesus. Our friends who uh, call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses, they, they will teach that Jesus is a, a, a lower level God, a, a demiurge descended from God. Then there are our Muslim friends who will say that Jesus was a prophet or a good man. There are our Jewish friends who will, uh, some will say that Jesus was just a fraud. Others will, will say that he was a good man. There are different people who say different things about Jesus. But what has God said. Just as the Bible is bookended by God speaking and filled with God speaking throughout, so also the ministry of Jesus is bookended by the voice of God. At His baptism and just before He went to the cross, John 12, and even at what you might call the pinnacle of His ministry, when his apostles realized who he was, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And about eight days later, he's on a mountaintop being transfigured and the Father speaks. His ministry is bookended and crescendoed by the voice of God. What has the Father said about the Son? The reason this is so important is because if we step back and think about it, the explicit and implicit truths that come from what God the Father has said about the Son are often contradictory to what people are teaching about the Son even today. It would behoove us to examine what has the Father declared about the Son. We think about Luke chapter 9, one of the, the records of Jesus' transfiguration. When Peter, James, and John are on that mountain with Him and Jesus is speaking with Moses and Elijah, and Peter and those that were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they awaked, they beheld Jesus in glory and the two that were with him. And as they departed, Peter says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Luke record, records that Peter said this not knowing what he said. We'll get to that momentarily. But then they're overcome with a bright cloud. They're afraid as the, they enter into the cloud, the cloud surrounds them, and then a voice, this is my beloved son, hear him. A voice from heaven has given imperative information about Christ. What is it said? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. 
It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. 2 Timothy 3, 16. Anything that God has said, we need to know. Through Moses, God gave the idea, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed to Israel, Moses would say, they belong to us and to our children forever. The principle still stands. What God has revealed belongs to us, belongs to our children and every subsequent generation that we should heed what God has said. Well, what has the Father said about the Son? Anything that God has said, He has said because He wants us to know it. So what does the Father want us to know about the Son? Let's go to the first event where the Father speaks from heaven during the Son's ministry. At the very outset of His ministry, the baptism of Jesus. Matthew 3, beginning in verse 16, Jesus has just been baptized by John the baptizer. A beautiful study in and of itself. But for our purposes this morning, Matthew 3, 16, Jesus, when He was baptized, came up straightway out of the water. And lo... He saw the heavens opened unto him, and the Spirit of God descending as a dove upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Father wants us to know first who His Son is. His Son is not someone named Muhammad that would come along some 600 years later. His Son is not named Buddha nor Confucius. His Son is Yeshua, it would be the Jewish pronunciation. We say Jesus. His Son is the one that demonstrated Himself to be Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One. His Son was the one that was born of a virgin in Bethlehem. The one that was brought up in the household of a poor carpenter in Nazareth. The one whose ministry sent ripples throughout the world, but it was in a a corner of the world known as Galilee and Judea. He was born into a poor family. He lived as a pauper. Yet the day that he was baptized by the one known as the forerunner, John the baptizer, heaven declared his identity. There are those today that say he was a good man. The father said, this is my son. The implications of that are, are boundless. We think about the words of Hebrews 1.8. The Hebrews writer recognized that the Father was referring to the Son back in the Psalms when this statement was made. Unto the Son He, the Father, saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of Thy kingdom. Hebrews 1.8 de demonstrates the Father declaring the Son to be deity. The Father calls His Son God, deity. Jesus, who is the Christ, was not simply a high prophet. Was He a prophet in a particular sense? Yes, Moses would describe Him as that prophet that would come after Him to, to whom the people would need to hear. Yes, Jesus filled the role of a prophet, but so much more. He's God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. He's deity. And to deny that is to deny His identity. To deny that is to deny Him. It's one thing to claim to have a respect for someone and a reverence for an individual, but if that respect and reverence declines to recognize that individual's identity or qualifying traits, that's not a real respect, is it? John chapter 1. The statement is made in verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, literally tabernacled among us. We beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When the Apostle John spoke of Christ coming in the flesh, he told of behold, uh, having beheld His glory. He would say, John 1, 17 and 18, The law came by Moses, but, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, the one who's in the bosom of the Father, He's declared Him to us. Not only has the Son declared the Father, but the Father declared the Son. At His very baptism, the outset of His ministry, this is my beloved Son, and for anyone 
to say concerning Jesus that He's anything less than God in the flesh is to refuse what the Father has said about His only begotten. John 1, 1 through 3, that Word that became flesh and dwelt among us, that, that one who is described as the Logos, the Word, it is said of Him, in the beginning was the Word. He's eternal. The Word was with God. He's distinct from the Father. The Word was God. He's deity. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. He's Creator. All of these attributes, these qualities, these traits are assigned to the Word, the one described as the Word, the one who became flesh, human. The one who, whose glory was beheld. The one who's described as the only begotten Son. When we talk about what heaven has to say about Jesus, that voice from heaven spoke because the Father wants us to know who the Son is. Now that being said... Not only does the Father want us to know who the Son is, but the Father wants us to hear what the Son says. We come to Luke chapter 9. Luke 9, Jesus has previously asked His apostles, Who do men say that I am? They said, Well, some say you're John the Baptist or Elias or one of the prophets. Uh, there were various rumors being spread about the identity of Jesus. Some of those rumors so ill-informed that they were identifying Jesus as the man that had baptized him. Who do you say that I am? Peter was the one who said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now Peter was not the first apostle to, to recognize the identity of Christ, but on this particular occasion, they've had enough time with Jesus to, to see multiple proofs and evidences of His very identity. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. And then shortly thereafter, Jesus would tell His apostles, we're going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of the elders, the, of the priests, the scribes, He's going to be killed and raised again the third day. And in response to this, Peter had said, Not so, Lord, be it far from thee. This shall not be unto thee. Yes, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, but we're not going to let this happen. Jesus told them of His impending death. They couldn't process it. Yes, He would reprimand Peter. He would emphasize to Peter that His priorities were those of man and not of God. But it's about... Eight days after this, according to Luke 9, 28, that Jesus takes Peter and James and John to a mountain apart to pray. And while he's praying with those three disciples that, that tended to be at some of those uh, special events throughout the special ministry of Jesus, the ones that were there when he resurrected Jairus' daughter, the ones that were, were there when... Uh, when Jesus is transfigured, these apostles, the ones that would be allowed to go further into Gethsemane with Him, Peter, James, and John, they're up on this mountain and they're taking a cat nap. Yes, there are times when sleep overwhelms us. For many of you, it's about the time that song ends and the preacher starts walking up here. That, that sleep just gets so heavy, right? Well, that's about how Peter and John felt. And James... They were overcome with sleep. But Jesus, as He prayed, His countenance, the fashion of His countenance was altered. His raiment, white, and glistering. And there spoke with Him two men, which were Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. By the way, it's not as though Moses and Elijah just took a special long trip from a few hundred miles away to come and meet up with Jesus. Moses had been buried by God some 1,400 years earlier. Elijah, some 800 years earlier, had been carried up in a chariot. These, Moses the lawgiver, Elijah the quintessential prophet, these are two people whose lives on earth were separated from Christ's life on earth by hundreds and over a thousand years. Yet here they are speaking with Christ. What do they discuss? Luke 9, 31, they spoke with Him concerning His decease 
which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, remember, Jesus has just told his apostles, we're going to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. And Peter was the one that said, "Uh uh-uh, no, we're not going to let it happen. And now here speaks Jesus with Moses, the lawgiver. Elijah, the quintessential prophet. By the way, if we think about the way certain phrases are utilized in the New Testament, anytime we read about the law and the prophets, it's an overview of the entirety of the Old Testament. Well, here's the lawgiver and the quintessential prophet that are talking to Jesus about a very specific topic, his death what you would accomplish at Jerusalem. The the very event that Peter and the other apostles wanted to deny its impending nature, wanted to prevent its impending nature, Moses and Elijah spoke to Jesus of its inevitability. Peter, James, and John were apparently too drowsy to catch the fullness of the conversation. But somehow they recognize that these two uh, individuals that are glowing and speaking with the glowing Jesus, they're Moses and they're Elijah. And thus when Peter awakens, he says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles. Luke records that Peter didn't know what he was saying. You ever speak when you're not sure of the, the import of your words? You really didn't realize the implications? Husbands, every one of you need to do this. Because we've all said something and didn't realize what the implications were until it came out of our mouths. At which point we wish we were limber enough to put our feet in our mouths. Well, here's Peter speaking before he really thinks about what he's saying. Mark's account records that Peter spoke not knowing what to say. Now that'll get us in trouble. I don't know what to say, but I feel like I've got to say something. So now I'm going to say something I don't even understand the import of it. Mm Mm-hmm. Peter, with the best of intentions, the worst of executions, says, Lord, let's build three tabernacles. Now, before we come down too hard on Peter, which sometimes we do, Matthew's account records that Jesus said, Lord, if thou wilt, let us build three tabernacles. Peter submitted his ambitions to the will of Christ. Lord, if you'll let us, we'll build three tabernacles. Peter didn't say, Jesus, get out of the way. we got some tabernacles to build. No, Lord, if you will. Yet even, Jesus, even Peter, in his recognition of Jesus' authority and his desire to submit to Jesus' will, needed a bit of a redirection here. And that redirection came not from Jesus the Christ, It came not from Moses the lawgiver, nor Elijah the prophet. That redirection for Peter's mindset came from even higher. The cloud overshadowed. This is my beloved son. Matthew's account, Matthew 17, 5, records the father adding the words, In whom I am well pleased, just as he had said at the baptism of Jesus. He says here at the crescendo of his ministry, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. Not continue listening to Moses, continue listening to Elijah. Oh, is there more to learn from Moses and Elijah? Whatsoever things are written aforetime are written for our learning, Romans 15, 4. Yes, we can continue to learn from the Old Testament, but the point being made was hear Christ. He's the authority. He's the one to follow. Peter, James, and John, having had the benefit of some three years following Jesus throughout his ministry, still had some more to learn about the implications of not only his identity, but his authority. Now, these thoughts being said, it's also worth noting that when that voice spoke, All three, according to Matthew 17, 6, they fell on their faces. They're afraid. They didn't behave like so many people claim to do today. Well, I talked to God in the dream last night. I just stood with Him face to face. Those that actually found themselves standing in the presence of God in Scripture didn't stand long. They knelt. They fell on their faces. They gave reverence. And even on the occasions when God lifted them, 
They paid reverence. And as Peter, James, and John fell to the ground, when they raised their heads, they saw none but Matthew 17, Jesus only. Mark 9, Jesus only. Luke 9, Jesus alone. And if we remember nothing else from this scene where Jesus is transfigured and the voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him. Remember what they saw as the event came to a close. Jesus only. Just Him. He's the standard. He's Messiah. He's the one to hear and to heed. So often in our world today, Jesus only just isn't enough. There are those that want more. There are those that want more than Jesus and His New Testament standard for the nature of His people, the church, for the nature of worship, for the nature of salvation, for the standard of morality and Christian living. There's those that want to appeal to other sources or they want to appeal to an expired Old Testament law for how they worship. Jesus only. They'll try to appeal to the Psalms or to the life of David in order to alter what the New Testament has to say about the sort of praise God expects of Christians instead of heeding Jesus only. Failing to remember that whoever shall keep the whole law yet offend in one point is guilty of all. Because anyone that would hold to the old law, the law of Moses, has to keep every bit of it. So anyone that would try to bring uh, a different standard for praise into the picture, anyone that would try to impose the, uh, the instruments or, or a, a different approach to worship has to hold to the burning of incense, the sacrifice of animals, which, by the way, he's offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he, forever Hebrews 10. Jesus only. He's our only Lord. He's our only standard. He's our only sacrifice. He's our only Messiah. He's our only. Hear Him. Will we hear Him as it pertains to the way that we're to live? Or, or will people today, even members of the Lord's church, try to appeal to the violations in the lives of men like David, Solomon, even Jacob, when it comes to marriage, well, God didn't really hold to His marriage law in the Old Testament. He lets David and Solomon and Jacob and others get away with polygamy. So, so surely Matthew 19 doesn't apply to Jesus only. By the way, brethren, when it comes to God's standard for the home, we need to be careful about assuming that the Jews' violations were a reflection of God's allowance and commendation of their behavior. In Mark 7, there's mention made of a tradition they have called Korban. They would claim, they would take money that they were supposed to be using to honor father and mother and support their parents, but they would say Korban, a Hebrew word meaning gift or an offering. And they would offer it to the, the temple, essentially for the temple to use those funds, until at which time the ones that had made that offering were, would go back and say, oh, okay, we'll take the investment back now and use it for our own good. Usually about three days after mom or dad was buried. Thus they're able to, to apply what their idea of a loophole, Jesus chastised them for making the law of God of none effect through their traditions. The point to be made here, they would practice behaviors and traditions that were a direct violation of God's law. They did it in the home as it pertained to their responsibilities to parents and they did it in the home as it pertained to their responsibilities toward husband and wife. Their violations are not an indication of God's approval. They're an indication of God's patience. Jesus only. We can appeal to Jewish violations to try to find some loophole under the Christian economy. We're under a better covenant, better promises. They were awaiting the Christ. We have the benefit of hindsight. Being able to look at the full story unfolded, the, the full plan brought to fruition. Why 
would we endeavor to try to use their violations as an excuse for deliberate ignorance? Jesus only. So what he has said applies, whether we're talking about the nature of the church, the, the nature of morality in the home, and the nature of salvation. Well, we heed Jesus only. Jesus was the one that declared the necessity of heeding his words. If any man has an ear to hear, let him hear. How many refused then? How many refused today? Jesus was the one that declared the necessity of trusting his identity. Except ye believe that I am he shall die in your sins, John 8, 24. How many refuse that identity? It was Jesus that declared the necessity of not only recognizing his identity, but admitting it, acknowledging it, declaring it. He would tell his apostles in the Great Commission, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Thus, any repentance that occurs is to occur because of his authority, who he is, a reflection of his identity. That's a confession that leads to a repentance. Or we think about Matthew 28 and following, Jesus said, you baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Baptism is an action that follows the recognition of his identity, hearing his message, believing his very identity, and what he did to demonstrate it, his death, his resurrection, and the proof he would leave. I believe he's the Son of God. Confessing. I don't want to live that way anymore. Repentance. I need to be washed. Baptism. Are Jesus' words good enough? Is God's standard good enough? Is Jesus only good enough? When the Father declared on that mountain of transfiguration, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, hear ye Him. Those words ring through the centuries. And they still beg to be heard by those today that would claim to hear Him, but they only want to hear part. That voice from heaven was spoken because the Father wants us to know who the Son is. The Father wants us to hear what the Son says. And the Father wants us to appreciate what His Son did. One more passage. John 12. Beginning in verse 23, Gentiles have just come to, to Philip uh, and they've said, Sir, we would see Jesus. The, uh, Philip comes to tell Jesus uh, uh, about the Gentiles uh, that are awaiting to see him. They can't enter into the temple where Jesus is. And Jesus begins what really seems to be perhaps a, a part of a final speech when he says, Now the Son of Man is glorified. And as he speaks about his glory, he says, Except. Uh, a seed of corn fall to the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, then it brings forth much fruit. He speaks of His glory, then He speaks of His death. Because His glory involved death. And as He speaks of His glory, which involved death, He would say in verse 27, Now is my soul troubled. Yes, it was an agony for Him. As he spoke of his glory, he spoke of his death. And as he spoke of his glory, he spoke of his trouble. Because this was not something to which he was looking forward. Oh yes, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. But he looked beyond the cross to the joy that would result from it. He didn't look to the cross as though it was some pleasurable experience. Now we're in John 12. Jesus will say, picking up at verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. At which point there came a voice from heaven. If you're moving your way through the book of John, this is the last public address John records. And a voice from heaven speaks. And as Jesus is discussing His glory, His death, the voice from heaven says, I have glorified my name and I will glorify my name. Because Jesus' glory involves his death and it troubles him, Jesus sets his focus on the Father's glory. Father, glorify thy name. How does the Father respond? I have, son, and I will. Most didn't understand it. They said it thundered, or an angel spoke to him, verse 29. 
Jesus says, this voice came for your sakes. This voice was spoken for your benefit. Why? What was their benefit? Because it's time for judgment to come in the world. Pick up at verse 32. Jesus says, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And this he spake concerning his death. The Father said, I've glorified my name and I will glorify it. And he would glorify his name through what the Son faced. He would glorify his name through the Son's death. Do we appreciate the glory demonstrated by the goriness of that scene? The love, the selflessness. Do we appreciate what was accomplished? Glance back in verse 27. Because Jesus says, now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this cause I came to this hour. The death that he was discussing was the very reason that he was there, that he came here. We can discuss what Jesus came to accomplish. John 6, he came to do the Father's will, absolutely. Matthew 5, he came to fulfill the law, yes. John 10, He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. But ultimately, Jesus came to accomplish two things. And in order to accomplish those two things, He died. He would say, Luke 19, 10, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus, what did it cost you to save souls? Matthew 26, 28, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. His death, His shedding of His blood accomplished extending salvation. Making salvation available, that's to the glory of God. When you think about God being willing to save souls, being willing to save sinful man, God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. When we think about that sacrifice and the horrors of Calvary, does it make you appreciate God does it stir your heart? Does it move your soul? Uh, does it cause you to, to sit in, in amazement at what He was willing to face on your behalf? Salvation. The very word just tastes good. Salvation. He came to do two things. All to the glory of God. He came to seek and to save the lost. And it cost him his blood to do it. Remember his words to Peter. After he had asked those disciples, who do men say that I am? Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed it to thee, but my Father in heaven. You're Peter. And upon this rock, this confession you just made, I will build my church. Jesus promised to do something else, and it was to build his church. Now connect that thought with Acts 20, verse 28. When the Apostle Paul, speaking to those elders from Ephesus, told them, feed the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. The same blood that was shed for the remission of sins, Matthew 26, 28, was shed to purchase his church. When you hear the word salvation, does it taste good? When you hear the word salvation, does it stir your heart? When you hear the idea of salvation and what God gave to make it available to you, do you see God's glory? Remember He said in John 12, I've glorified My name and will glorify it. How is He going to glorify His name? Through the sacrifice of His Son. What did that accomplish? Saving souls, but it accomplished something else. And just as there is glory, there is love, there is selflessness, in the extension of salvation there is glory. There is love and there is selflessness in the establishment of His church. Upon this rock I will build my church. And the idea of the church that belongs to Jesus should stir our hearts and move our souls as much as the word salvation. Because according to Acts 2, 47, the Lord asked to the church daily such as are being saved. They go hand in hand. A voice from heaven wants you me and all of us to know something. It wants us to know who His Son is. It wants us to hear what His Son says. 
And it wants us to appreciate what His Son did. Did He save us? Absolutely. But we don't understand salvation if we don't understand its connection to the church. We don't understand salvation if we don't understand the value of the church. So you think about those that are in the pews near you. Those that are in this building worshiping together. And those that are part of the church that can't be here because they're kept because of some uh, medical reason and, or, or some otherwise beyond their control reason. Those that have submitted to the Lord. Those that have followed after His plan of salvation and been washed in the blood of the Lamb. There is church. They've recognized His identity. They've submitted to His authority. They become part of His body to the glory of God. The Apostle Paul in writing to the Ephesians would make the point that unto Him be glory in the church throughout all ages, world without end. You want to behold God's glory. Look at how He brought the saved together. That voice from heaven still speaks, ringing through the ages every time we read the pages of the Word. Are we willing to hear and listen? Now it's simply left for us to consider what that voice is calling us to do. Follow the Son. The Son spoke to the apostles and said, Teach men to observe all that I've commanded you, Matthew 20, 28, uh, 19 and 20. Thus, the, the Son's instructions are not only found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but throughout the New Testament, the inspired words of the apostles, will we heed them? When it comes to our standard of living and morality, when it comes to our understanding of the church, when it comes to our worship, when it comes to salvation. Maybe there's someone here today that's been listening to too many voices from earth and not a voice from heaven. Too many family members or friends as it pertains to what it means to be a Christian instead of letting God's Word serve as the standard and God's Son serve as the example. Maybe it's the case that this morning that voice from heaven is calling your name to be washed in the blood of His beloved Son and who He is well pleased because it's only when we do that that He's going to be well pleased in us. Maybe it's the case that you're a child of God and it's time to come home. Whatever the situation may be, hear that voice from heaven. Respond to it. Come forward while we stand together and while we sing. Have you been to...